Well, good morning, church. What a beautiful day to worship the Lord together. Please stand and join us on Cornerstone. you a little bit of hope this morning, just reminding ourselves that even though our world seems to be very chaotic and filled with a lot of hateful feelings right now, that we still have something we can ground ourselves to, and that's God, and that's his love, and let's demonstrate his love to the world around us. So we pour 
We're going to sing Who You Say I Am, and I think this is a really important time when we examine ourselves and decide, can we really say that we belong to God, that we've reached out to him and we've asked him to ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. It's really important to know where you stand today in eternity. So let's sing Who You Say I Am. Yeah. 
seated. I sure hope you can say that today. You are a child of God because of Jesus Christ in your life. Great to see everybody today. We are going to, in just a moment, be in Luke chapter 4, Luke's Gospel, fourth chapter, reading two verses, verse 18 and 19. I'll meet you there in just a second. Uh, but I want to greet everybody here, everybody at home, everybody watching, whether it's on our live feed, on our website, Heritage Park Live, or maybe later on uh, in our one of our recorded sessions on YouTube or Facebook, or we're out there. Good to see everybody. Glad you're with us. You know, something that's pretty big today is restoration, right? It's a big thing. Uh, turn on to almost any TV network, right, uh, on the cable stations, and you're going to find uh, TV shows about restoration, restoring houses, furniture, machinery, toys, cars, you name it. People are restoring it and, uh, and reselling it for some pretty good money. A um, little over 20 years ago, I started tinkering around with a car that I had and just wanting to learn more um, about cars, more than uh, being able to just do oil changes and change spark plugs. And so I began tinkering. And around the same time, my kids started getting their cars, their first cars. And um, as you can imagine, they weren't the... Uh, uh, the greatest things on the planet, but uh, kind of got me involved in working on their cars as well. So the tinkering uh, got me into doing with the kids' cars, and that led me to taking classes at a local vocational school for auto body. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. I've been taking those classes where you bring your own stuff into the class and you work on it. And doing that led me to attempt my very first complete restoration. And I learned some things about restoration, about restoring anything, but in this case I'm going to refer to cars because that's what I'm familiar with, and that's what I like. And you'll have to endure if you don't. <laughs> I learned that there are plenty of setbacks. I learned that there are surprises along the way. Uh, I also learned that there are a lot of frustrations and, at times, pain. Sometimes emergency room stitches pain, but we won't go there. <laughs> I learned that it's harder than you imagined. It takes longer than you anticipated. It costs more than you expected. It needs, or a person who does it needs patience, determination, and a lot of help. I got a lot of help. I got a lot of help from Carl. I got a lot of help from others in the congregation, some who have moved on already and uh, to a different location and stuff. But, uh, and then, of course, instructors and people I've met along the way. And I think this idea of restoring a car is a perfect illustration of Jesus and what he does. He is the master restorer. And I want to share with you God's principles for restoration this week and next. Because, as I said, this, this idea of restoring something is a great illustration of what God not only does but loves to do for each of us. I'm going to ask for the next slide. The next, the, that one is the car I bought. This one is a picture of, the, uh, of what I called the goal. This picture was hanging in the garage for seven plus years while I worked on the one you saw in the first picture because that's what it was supposed to look like, ultimately. And it's always good to have a goal, right? Always good to keep your eye on the prize. And I learned some things here that I, I want to share with you and uh, the, the, the aspect of restoring something like a car, and then we're going to transition into the spiritual, okay? I learned, first of all, if you want to restore a car, you should research the value. That makes sense. Uh, what it's going to cost you 
when you buy it and approximately how much it will cost you to restore it. And at the end of the project, you want to see if the value of the restored vehicle is going to be at least as much or more than what you put into it. And normally, if it isn't, you'll be upside down and you'd probably want to stay away from it. But there are a couple of exceptions there. One exception is that um, that car may hold some sentimental value. It may have been in your family. It may have been your dad's or even handed down from your grandfather. And it didn't get a lot of attention over the years, but it has that value that you want to restore it and bring it back and re those fond memories. And you don't really care what the value is at the end or, or how much it's going to cost to bring it back. And a lot of people do that. And a lot of people do it to invest. And so uh, that upside down thing is uh, very important. But, you know, you, you may just, maybe you just want to learn. That's really what I had in mind. I just wanted to learn how to restore a car. And uh, I was interested in what the value would be at the end because we don't have particularly deep pockets and money to just throw at stuff. Uh, but that was one of the things I wanted to do. Um, you have to research the value, and then you have to realize the potential. What's your goal? What do you want to do? What, is it, what do you want this to be? Uh, most people restore a car with the intent of bringing it back to its original glory, and more often than not, when you restore it, bringing it back to even better than original glory. And a lot of people make that their goal as well. What's the potential that's there? That's why you find a picture of what it looked like. That's why you've got a picture in your head of what it used to be to you. And then you redeem it from ruin. In other words, you negotiate a price and you make it yours. Because it's not doing you any good sitting in somebody else's yard rotting away. So you have to pay a price to make it yours. Now again, if it's handed down through the, through the family or somebody just says, hey, I'll give it to you if you want to get it off my lot. You know, but these days, more often than not, people know what they have and they know that it can be worth something. So they're going to want something for it. Sometimes they want a little too much because they know a little too much and it's not really worth that investment but you have to buy it that makes sense right redeem it make it yours and then you've got to repair what's broken that's when the work begins you get it home you start tearing it apart you look at, at uh, the work it needs the damage it may have what needs to be replaced you start making a list and assessing these things putting a value to it and then you get to work that's really the fun part, tearing it down and getting to work. And then the final principle is this, you return the beauty. Bring it back to its full potential. It's better than new glory. Something that you're excited about, something that you're proud of, something that you, you can put on display as you drive it around on a beautiful sunny day or maybe take it to a show. And something that you can say, you know what, I, this is something I did. This is... This is something with my own hands. It may not be perfect. I'm not a professional, right? But return it to its beauty. So I want to read to you, as I said, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And here in Luke chapter 4, Luke tells us that um, Jesus was out in the wilderness, tempted by Satan. And after that, he returned in the power of the Spirit, and he went around throughout Galilee, uh, teaching in the synagogues. And here in chapter 4, he, he's in his hometown, Nazareth. And he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. And the reading for the day was this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel or the good news to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 
And then he rolled up that scroll, handed it back to the attendants, and he said, today, this is fulfilled in your presence. Speaking of himself. This passage of Scripture, Jesus said, is about him. And he says, this is what the Spirit of the Lord has for me to do. This is what God sent me to do. And you read that and you go, wow. That's all restoration there. To deliver good news to those who are poor in spirit. To those who are, have a spiritual uh, uh, longing and a need. And, and then he says, to uh, heal the brokenhearted. My lands. You know, if there's probably one category, one large category of people in our society, in our world today, it's the brokenhearted, is it not? Brokenhearted. And folks, listen. Jesus is the great physician. He's the great restorer. We've got the answer. And as He ministers to our broken hearts, we can share that with others who are broken hearted. Whatever it is they're broken hearted over. They need to understand that Jesus really is the answer. And then He says to proclaim liberty to the captives. That car I showed earlier, it was just sitting. It was owned by somebody else. It was just sitting. It was crying out for help every time we drove by it. It seemed like it was calling my name. And, and little tell you, I say, I wonder what they're going to do with that car. When are they going to get busy on it? It had a flat tire. It had some rust. It had pine needles and leaves all over it. And it's just sitting there time after time after time and you see that's that's my heart when i see and of course i love cars but even when i see an old house or something like that and i wow the what that could be restored to what that could be and i believe that's god's heart as well jesus said i came to heal the brokenhearted and and to proclaim the liberty to redeem those who are captive Liberty, to give them freedom, to free them, and uh, uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so, I want to cover just like the first three, maybe two and a half principles that I ran through, and we'll pick it up next week, because I, I could have done the whole thing, but I knew it would be pressed for time. We talked about the first principle, research the value. Research the value. You know, folks, listen. There are a whole lot of people today, and maybe some of them sitting here or watching at home, who don't think they're worth very much. They don't think that there's a whole lot within them that is of value. Maybe they've been told that in their youth. A lot of people here, you're worthless, you're good for nothing. And they're treated that way sometimes. And even in adulthood, maybe in a, in a relationship, in a marriage, that you're, those words come out and they hurt and they sting. And we may say, well, that, you know, we, we, we can play tough, right? And Oh, that doesn't really bother me. Yes, it does. And I know we talk a lot about the Word of God saying that, that we're, we're sinners. We're born with a sin nature. And there's none righteous. No, not one. And, and, and we can get down on ourselves because we have a propensity for doing the wrong thing. And I want you, if you know Christ as your Savior, I want you to be very careful about that. Yes, we strive to follow Christ. We strive to do the right thing. And you know, even the Apostle Paul said, the things that I want to do, those are the things I find I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I find I end up doing them. Because there's this law of sin 
that, that wars in this body against the Spirit and the Spirit warring against that. But he cried out, Who will give me this victory? I have the victory in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So yeah, we don't want to just intentionally sin, but when we do, remember, God does love us, and if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from that unrighteousness. But I want to back up a step. Before you came to know Christ, God showed how valuable you are to Him. And that's our first principle. Research the value. God proved how valuable you are to Him. You know John 3.16. Many of you know it as well as I do. I want to give it to you this way. This is how God loved the world. He gave His one-of-a-kind Son so everyone who trusts in Him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Paul gives it to us this way in Romans chapter 5. God demonstrates His love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Christ died for us. I love where John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us through the gift of His Son. Now listen, this is how God values you and you at home and anybody listening, everybody in the world. This is how, John, John said in John 3.16, this is how God loved the whole world. And we have to understand that if God valued the whole world that way, because we've come to know Christ as our Savior, it's our job, it's our duty, it's our, our, our joy and our responsibility to share that with others. To tell others, listen, God values you so much, He gave His Son for you. That if you place your faith in Him, you've got everlasting life. Can you, can you think of a better gift? Can you think of a better way for God to show love than to sacrifice His Son, the second person of the triune Godhead, to sacrifice Him on a cross? The cruel and inhumane uh, treatment that He received, not to mention the rejection that, went, that led to that, to Make Him take our place and our punishment and our judgment, everything we deserve, and He took it for everybody. And here's, here's what He says. I'll do it for you so that if you put your faith in Me, I'll give you forgiveness and eternal life. Listen, don't... don't complain that God doesn't love you because you can't find a parking place close to the mall at Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Oh, if God loved me, He would... And you fill in the blank. You know what? God does love me, and He showed it 2,000 years ago on the cross of Christ. He values you. He values you. Here's what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53 about the Messiah that was yet to come in His day. He was wounded for our transgressions, and He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Stripes, the word there means deep wounds. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's love. 
And love is lavished on those who are valued. Now something funny with regard to the car. Um, this particular, the, the other slide, we don't have to go there, but the other one that I showed you, the goal. Um, if you're not familiar with it, that's referred to by many people as the bandit edition because of Smokey and the Bandit, the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, it's, it was, there was never a Bandit edition put out by Pontiac, but it was called the Special Edition, an SE. Well, when I bought the car, and you can see, it, it had real, no real resemblance in my mind. It, it was nothing there to let me know that it was a Special Edition when I bought it. And I had in my mind what I was going to do to it, but when I got it home, I started looking up all the identification numbers, and I'm like, what? I've got a special edition here. Well, that, that radically changed everything. Changed how I was going to do things. And, and I mean, it just completely changed, and the value went up. You who know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're a child of God. You see, there's value in that. There's a great deal of value in that. God values everybody. He loves everybody the same. But now when He looks upon us, He sees the righteousness of His Son that's been, uh, that's been applied to us, to our account. And He sees us as, as his special possession, his chosen ones. Man, don't, don't think that God doesn't love you. Don't think that you're not worth anything. God says, you are valuable to him. And that puts us back to, I think the next slide is that picture of the goal, if I'm not mistaken. There it is. So he proved how valuable you are to him, and he knows the potential that you have for him. Remember this, God knew you before he created the world. Before he created anything, he knew everything about you. I, you know, these people who, because they can't wrap their heads around God, say there is no God, that, to me, is the, the highest form of arrogance. Basing everything in the universe around what you know. Really. <laughs> Let's be honest about things. We don't know a whole lot. We know a whole lot less than we think we know. And the Word of God says... That God, the eternal God, well, if, how could God exist forever? I don't know. He's God. It's just, I just believe the book. Someday I get to be with him and learn these things. The eternal God knew your name, knew every part of you inside and out and every part of your life in eternity past. Now think about this. this. This is amazing. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says this. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not only did God know me and know you, knew all about us, He has also prepared something for us. Good works. Works for us to do. And for, for everybody, there are certain things in the Word of God, black and white, do this. Right? And those are some of those good works. But then, I believe that God has individual Things for us to do that he hasn't called everybody to do. You say, well, what about me? Ask the Lord to show you. 
God, show me the works that you have prepared specifically for me to do for you. And guess what? He will. Because he's not, he didn't just draw up a plan for your life and shelve it. Say, yeah, that was a good idea, but eh. You know, and well, you've come this far, and eh, there's some stuff, and that. no, uh uh, that's not God. He still wants to do it. There's a, a term in car restoration. A car sometimes is known as a basket case. Okay, a basket case. For those who are in the profession, a basket case would be something that they probably wouldn't take on as a, as a pro- because that means it is really far gone and it would take too much money and too much time and too much labor to restore. It's almost the one I have now, right? <laughs> I'm not showing a picture of that one. We are fallen. We are flawed. Our nature is fallen and flawed. And folks, listen, we are all basket cases. But no one, no restoration is too difficult for God. He doesn't look at anybody and say, "Mm, not worth the time, not worth the effort. Not worth what Jesus did on the cross. Mm -mm. No one is a basket case when it comes to God's restorative plan and restorative power. And when we're talking about potential, He knows what you're capable of becoming. The word potential means capable of being or becoming. It means a latent excellence or ability that either can or can or will not be developed and god knows remember he made you he made us and and we each have something special we have a lot in common but you know what there are some things that are just unique to us to you to me to others And I believe that God has done that and has gifted each of us to do things that only we can do. And maybe there are some others around, but not everybody can. You see what I'm saying? And God knows what potential you have. Uh, He knows that you have the potential to be godly. Think about that. Even though we have a sin nature, even though we're battling that nature all the time, we can still be godly. You know what godly means? It means being focused on God and following Him. Pure and simple. Doesn't mean sinless. Because the Bible tells us we we are not sinless. We will never be sinless until we cross the threshold of this life and get to heaven. And then, whoo! Talk about free at last. And some of us wake up some mornings and go, man, I wish, I wish today was the day. <laughs> but we have the potential to be godly. Here's what, uh, here's what Peter wrote in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Think about that. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. He says we've received all of this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellency. So what what has God given me? We're partakers of the divine nature in Christ. God has changed us in Christ. We now have the Spirit of God living within us. So there is that war against the flesh, against carnality. 
Because the Spirit of God is there to help us live for God. He's given us His Word. I say this all the time. The instruction manual is here. And it's not just an instruction manual. It's a love letter. I have to say it again. Please, be in your Bible. Read your Bible. Every day, spend some time in your Bible, even if you only have time to read one chapter out of one of the Gospels. Say, God, I've got a few minutes here for you. Please speak to me. Because I need you. And God's, he's all over that. He's all over that. So he knows that you have the potential to be godly, to mirror him to the world. And then he knows that you have the potential to be faithful. I want you to listen to this. Many of you know Galatians 5.22, but you only know like the first part of it. All right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to ask how many of you only know that part. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, humility, self-control, and faithfulness. The word faith is the same word in the Greek for faith or faithfulness. And here's what faithfulness is. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> faithfulness refers to the character of one who can be relied on and one who keeps their promises. So faith is a trust in God's faithfulness, right? But God calls us to be godly, so He gives us the fruit of the Spirit, which is faithfulness, so that people can rely on us. Now, I want to say something. A Christian who doesn't keep their word and their promises is doing the gospel a disservice. You're doing people wrong and you're not representing God. There's a passage in the Old Testament. When you vow a vow, defer not to pay it. You know what that means? Let me put that into like just every day. When you make a promise, do it and do it fast. Don't put it off. If anybody should be people of their word, it should be God's people. God is truth. God's word is truth. Jesus is truth. We have the spirit of truth indwelling us. Jesus said, let, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Because anything otherwise is sin. So when you tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. Do it. And do it right away. And do it well. Because you're working for the Lord. There were a couple of things that happened really within the last few weeks where I, I probably had close to a half a dozen people tell me they were going to do something. And didn't do it. Not, not, I'm just talking about people. I mean, just in the course of life. <laughs> and we talked about it at home. I said, drives me nuts. Drives me nuts. I mean, we say we're going to do something. We do it. And if, if I don't get it done, I'm on the phone saying, hey, I'm really sorry. This came up, right, Mike? And, and I'm, we'll do it. I just couldn't do it when I thought I could. You know, people appreciate that. People appreciate if you give them a phone call and say, hey, listen, I know we talked about doing, so I told you I would do this. Something happened. I couldn't do it on this day, but man, I will definitely do it. Bingo. 
I don't know what's hard about that. I don't know what's wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. I think there's everything right about doing that. Am I the only one? I, I, I'm just saying. Let's be people of our word. Faithfulness. Faithful people that other people can rely on. So that when your name comes up in conversation, people say, man, I'll tell you what. They say they're going to do something and they do it. And they do it well. They do it right. I mean, you know, remember the old days before you needed contracts in triplicate and signatures, like three, four signatures on each page? It was a handshake. Your bond was your word. And if you didn't keep your word, guess what? People knew about it real quick. But God knows that you have the potential to be faithful when you realize what, who God is, His faithfulness, and what He wants you to be. And what did Peter say? He's given us everything that we need to live a godly life. You know what? <laughs> God has given you a calendar in your computer with reminders, and on your phone. <laughs> I'm being a little, hopefully not over the top, a little facetious, but we've got all sorts of ways and, and helps in order to be faithful. He knows you have the potential to be godly, to be faithful, and then to be influential for Him. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? He said, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on the hill cannot be hidden. It, you see the lights. He said nobody lights a candle and then puts it under a basket. The candle is lit to be seen. He said, let your light shine before men in this way for people everywhere to see it so that they may see what? Your good works. And glorify your Father who's in heaven. And God knows that you have the potential to be influential for Him. And He loves that. He wants to restore you and work that in your life. And then number three, I'm going to hit on this. We talked about researching the value, realizing the potential, and then redeeming from ruin. And I know, by and large, I've been talking to believers. I want you to remember, those of you who have trusted Christ as your Savior, that you are redeemed. Now, the word redeem means to be purchased. Literally, to, to the ransom has been paid. And the idea goes all the way back to the slave markets in the Roman Empire. There were like six million slaves in the Roman Empire in Paul's day. And when somebody purchased a slave, whether to be their property and, and to come back and work for them, or maybe just to purchase them and set them free, that's the idea, you see? To be redeemed, we in Christ have been redeemed out of the slave market of sin and set free unto God. So if you know Christ, you know what you're free to do? You're free to live for God. You're not in bondage to sin anymore. And for those of you at home, maybe somebody watching right now, you've been trying to earn your freedom with your good works and your religious deeds and being a good person and all of that stuff. <clears throat> That's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. Commendable. But the only way you're redeemed is when there's a price paid for you. 
And the Word of God says, God paid plenty to redeem you. Peter said we were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your empty uh, way of living that was received by tradition from your fathers, but we're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood that He spilled for us. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He shed His blood for you. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin, the Bible says. The life of the flesh is in the blood, all the way back to the Mosaic Law. And Jesus spilled His blood, the precious blood, in order to redeem us. And if you're at home and you've never asked Christ into your life, you're watching this and, and you say, wow, I always thought it was, it was keeping rules and regulations of my religion and, 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 and doing this and doing that. No. It's by putting your faith in the crucified, resurrected Son of God and the payment that He paid for you, the penalty He paid for you on the cross, and the blood that He spilled to pay for you. To purchase you from the other guy. Out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Paul wrote in the book of Colossians. Listen to this in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, I want you to hear this you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Spiritually dead. You used to live in sin like the rest of the world, obeying the devil who's the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Boy, wow. Think about that. The devil himself, Satan is the commander, of, uh, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. I want to say something to believers who choose not to follow the Word of God and not obey the Word of God. And by the way, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And we can't pick and choose which ones we like and don't like. Oh, this is oh this this one I can do. This one, eh, I don't think so. You know, I just don't like that one. It doesn't fit me. It doesn't fit my lifestyle. It, mm. You know who's saying that? That's what Peter said. He's the spirit at work, not God, in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. He says, all of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, <clears throat> and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It's only by grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Here's why he did it. So God can point to us in the ages to come as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he's done for us who are united. In Christ Jesus. It, the word ages is eons. So that in the eons to come, someday, and I, I had a Bible college professor explain it this way, and I loved it. We were all yelling in his class. He, he also taught us Greek. So we were yelling doxa, which is glory. Glory in Greek. He said, God's going to have this big parade and all the angels will be in the stands. And we're going to be paraded through the Colosseum or the stadium, right? And, and he's, going to see, see, he's going to say, see that one over there? She was a prostitute. 
But she received my son and I saved her. And she, she lived in glory for me. And, and see that one over there? He was a thief and a scoundrel. And, and he would just go on and on. And we're like, yeah, that's what Paul's saying here. In the ages to come, God's going to point to us and say, I saved that one. I saved that one. You know, the angels don't understand that. They don't understand all of this fully. The, the Bible talks about the, the things that the angels are looking into, peering into, and the same word is used of the disciples when they heard Jesus, when they heard that the tomb was empty, and they ran, and I know Peter dove in, but John got there first. It says he peered in. He looked in. It's the same word used for the angels who are peering into this thing of salvation. They don't fully get it. And so someday God's going to show them why. <laughs> With that mighty procession of His glory. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you allowed God to redeem you to Himself with the shed blood of His Son. Some people say, listen, you want a car? You want a restored car? Buy one that just doesn't need any work so you can jump in and drive it. I get that. But you know what? I love the work. I love the that restoration process. And you know what? God does too. And He wants to restore your life. If you haven't been redeemed yet, you, know, you need to receive Jesus. Be born into the family of God spiritually. If you have been redeemed, you need to let God work in your life. Doing your own thing. You know, I had to, I had to consult all sorts of manuals. I, had to, I read a whole bunch of stuff online. I had teachers that I would text and, and ask questions to uh, of. If I just decided to do my own thing, I'd be, I wouldn't be on the road. <laughs> Listen, here it is. Here it is. The path to restoration. Jesus wants to redeem you, begin restoring you today, right now. He specializes in basket cases. Basket cases who need salvation, restoration. What is it in your life that's broken and needs to be restored? Could be a relationship, trust, hope, your confidence, and maybe you're saying, just me. I am broken and I need to be restored. I need God in my life. God is the master restorer. He restores my soul, David said in the book of Psalms. God said through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, he said, I know the plans that I have for you and they're plans for good, not evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. God absolutely loves to restore. Now, restoration is a process, but it starts with redemption. And he's asking you to place your faith in what he has already done for you in the cross of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you'd like to ask Christ into your life. Restoration starts with redemption. He's already paid the price for you. All you have to do is say, Yes, I want to be redeemed and restored. Why not bow your head and repeat this simple prayer? Lord God, I am broken. And I need to be restored. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. And be my restorer. In your name, I pray. If you prayed that prayer, we want to rejoice with you. We want to keep you in prayer. We'd love to know. Would you please just click on the button there on Heritage Park Live on your screen, the button that says, 
I've committed my life to Christ. It's just going to let us know that somebody out there in our viewing audience on live has asked Christ into their life for restoration, for redemption. And uh, if you need extra prayer or prayer about something in particular, please let us know. We'll be happy to pray with you. We'll even, if you need a phone call, if you need to pray with somebody personally, whatever it is, if you need a Bible, let us know. We'll send you one. Restoration is a process. It starts with redemption, but it doesn't end there. It just starts there. And so I want you to tune in next week. My invitation for you to come back next week as I hit part two of God's principles for restoration. And I know you're going to enjoy it and be blessed by it. And one last thing, thank you again, all of our faithful givers. I want to ask you to hit the donate button and uh, give as you have been. And all your gifts are, and contributions are tax deductible. And we so appreciate you uh, just continuing the ministry here at Heritage Park as we share the good news of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Restorer. And there's a link there, as every week I ask you to click onto it after you've donated for our offertory song. I know it's going to minister to your heart. You are going to enjoy it. God bless. I'll see you next week.